The program tonight is part of the White Lake Environmental History Project. If you haven't picked up one of these, this will tell you about it. It'll tell you about the website to go to uh, that has all of our stuff on there. That, the big project is funded by the Michigan Humanities Council and it was undertaken to explore and document, document our local environmental history and our cleanup, if you know about the pollution era. Um, in this larger project, we have several activities, and one of them is to hold environmental education programs for families, so we have tonight's program for that. We were recording oral histories from local residents, and a lot of them, and more to come, have been posted here on the website. So you can go in, listen to them, find out what happened way back, uh, and hear it straight from people who have lived here and lived through that era. We're also collecting historical materials and scanning them and putting them on the website as well. And we did set up the website. And from all of this, we are hoping next year that uh, we will have a book written that will take all that information and examine the area's pollution era and the recovery as we come off the list of hotspots. Now, tonight's program is being given by Up Close and Wild from the Outdoor Discovery Center, and they're in Holland, and that's as far as I got. <laughs> but the brochures that they have are over here, and you can go down there and explore and find all kinds of other stuff other than what they've just brought tonight. Um, and this program was funded by a grant from the White Lake Community Fund of the Community Foundation of Muskegon. They were very, very helpful for us. And they, with their funding, we're getting about six of these programs in. And without any further ado, I'm turning it over to Jamie yep. and Delan. You got it. They're going to show you the critters they brought. <laughs> very good. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, my name is Jamie Krupka. I'm here from uh, the, the Outdoor Discovery, as, Sel as uh, Shelley mentioned, and uh, Delena Eisenman, my uh, uh, co-worker assistant here, is going to be helping us learn as well. Our plan this evening is to share some animals with you that we have at the Outdoor Discovery Center that we use to teach people about the environment and their outdoors in their backyards. Know that all of the animals that we brought to share with you this evening are not pets, they're wild animals. And part of the rules of how, about having wild animals is that you have to have permission. After tonight, I'm, I'm hoping that you're very excited to go find wildlife, but you can't keep it. You can't go home and start catching turtles and snakes and frogs in your backyard because those are wild animals. We want them to stay wild. If you want a pet, go to the pet store. Don't go to the wild. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about the animals that we have today and why we have them a little bit. Uh, know that we do have permission from the state of Michigan as well as the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> to have these things. You can't just go out there and like, I'm going to go catch a robin and make it a pet. Okay? There are rules out there and we have to make reports. You are all not only going to be documented on film this evening, but you're going to be part of a report that we turn into the government that says, yep, we came and visited here at the library on this day this evening. Okay? We want you to learn about the things that live in your backyard, those, those animals that exist here in the area. And so what we've done is we've collected up some critters and we'll talk about their life history and how they are impacted by people and how they can be helped by people, okay? We have things like reptiles, amphibians. We have some uh, uh, things that are not alive, um, some skins or skull, skulls, things like that, feathers maybe even. And we even have a couple of birds to share. I'll be doing the majority of the talking, although Delena here may pipe in and remind me of something that I've forgotten. Um, our plan is to get through our animals here, and as I'm talking, Delena will be the one that will be working her way around the room for you to look at these things closer. Most of the things we brought, you will be able to touch and look at closer by, by exploring them with your fingers, okay? As we're doing that, um, keep in mind, I'm going to still keep on talking too, but you will get a chance to touch some of these things that we brought today. I say some because there are a few examples of things you will not be able to touch. Yes? So if the kids sit still right where they're at, the animals will... Yeah, we will do kind of, uh, Delena will do like the figure eight. You can stay where you are. If you happen to be in the middle, when Delena walks by, she will get closer to you and let you get it a little bit closer, okay? <laughs> she might do something like that for you to be able to, to, to touch it, okay? So thank you for the clarification. Yeah, if there is <laughs> Something that you want, if you something you wanted to touch and, and you don't get the chance, just say, "Oh, Delena, can I touch that?" She's she'll respond nicely to that. So uh, she, she she's she's very good at that. Okay. So without 
further ado uh, about our organization quickly because we are a conservation-based organization. We're all about education. We were joking earlier, Delana just had 100 kindergartners that she worked with today. Not by herself. She had three people to help her out. So there was four people and, and, and uh, 100 kindergartners. I had a group myself of another group of kindergartners from the Hudsonville area. They had Hudsonville area. Nonetheless, we are all about education. So we're used to questions. We're used to stories that kind of sound like a question. And we're used to questions that really kind of sound like a story. Okay, so that's all right. We like those things. Uh, that helps us know what you do know, what you don't know, and what you're curious about. So please, don't hesitate to interject with comments or ask questions. If you want to know more about us, please come and visit. We are free and open to the public. There's those brochures right over there. We'd love to have you come visit. Hour and 10 minutes or something like that it was for us to get here. Not too, not too long. Yeah, you were just a passenger. You're like, yeah, sure, whatever. Okay. So let's, let's get going on our first group of critters. Uh, this first group of animals is a group of animals that is known for its texture of its skin. Slimy, bumpy, warty skin. It's a group of animals that can be very easily impacted by people. With the chemicals that we use, fertilizers on our lawn, oil that we have in our car. Raise your hand if you rode your bike here. Good. Raise your hand if you walked here. No walkers. Raise your hand if you drove in a motor vehicle of some sort. Okay. Truck, bus, car, moped, motorcycle. Okay. So you used, if you were, even if you were on a bicycle, there are chemicals that are used to make your bicycle work. Otherwise, it would go and you go along. So there are oils and, and things that we use on our vehicles, even something like a bicycle. And if those get into the environment, it might hurt some of the animals that we're going to share with you. The first one is one that you might be able to identify by hearing it, by hearing it. Now, I'm going to play some sounds here. I'm not just playing with my phone, texting my wife or anything like that. I'm going to actually play a sound for you of an animal and see if you can identify which, which animal makes this sound. What is it? Good guess. It's not a frog, but it might look like a frog to you. But it has more of a bumpy, warty skin. Uh, oh, good try. Not a bird. A lot of students think it's a bird. A toad is right. We're going to have Miss Delana get out a toad for us to see closer. Now, this is probably one of the smaller animals that we have brought to share with you this evening. So she's going to have to get pretty close for you to be able to see it. This is the American toad. We have two different kinds of toads. We have the American toad. Raise your hand if you've heard that sound of the American toad. Okay. Good. This is something where you can tell the American toad immediately. Can you hear that? It was going. Rah, 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 rah. That's how you can tell the boys from the girls. If you pick up a toad, you find one in your yard, and you hold it by its armpits, and just hold it like this. If it's a boy, it'll go. Rah, 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 and make some noises. The girls will just <laughs> stare at you. OK? So as Delana works her way around the room, you're welcome to touch it. OK? You might be able to hear it, too. As she holds it kind of by its armpits, it might be making noises. You can even rest your fingers along its back, and you'll feel it kind of vibrating like it has the shivers. It'll go bzzz, 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 but it won't shock you. It's vibrating its body. Like a phone does. When kind of like the vibrate mode on a phone. You got it right on. So there is another kind of a toad. This is the American toad. We also have another kind of a toad called a fowler's toad. So we heard the American toad. This is what, it, again, it sounds like. But the other toad we have sounds very different. I imagine that it's like a baby crying out in the woods. Oh, very sad. That is the fowler's toad. We only have two different kinds of toads. Both of these are animals that will use wetland habitats. They're going to use these places that have water sometimes. They're not going to live in a great big lake. Sometimes we say the places that they like to live are these seasonal pools or puddles you might find in the middle of a forest, these vernal pools. What they will do is find these little bodies of water, little pockets of water where there are no fish. Why do you think he would prefer a place and she would prefer a place without fish? What would be the advantage of that? Because the fish would eat them. Exactly. This looks like this part of a life cycle. Good job. This is an animal that would be food for a fish. So we need these little ponds and wetlands 
you might look at them and think, oh man, I don't want that there because there's going to be mosquitoes. And don't get me wrong, mosquitoes do live in water. But if you have tadpoles living in that pond or that wetland, guess what they like to eat? All sorts of things like plants and bugs. And so by allowing something like toads to live in these ponds and wetlands, they may help control our bug problems. We don't need to spray chemicals out there to kill the bugs. We'll let the toads eat them. And this is an animal that you can find throughout Michigan. The fowler's toad, this is the American toad, the fowler's toad is going to be more likely found in very sandy dune environments. If you were to go closer to Lake Michigan, that way, okay, you might find a fowler's toad. The American toad this is. The, the females will not make that noise. As she brings it around, you might be hearing it going, rrr, 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 making this little noise. That tells you it's a boy. They do not. I was just going to say that. One of the things that people had concern, were very concerned about is warts. Like, oh, don't touch the toad. It's going to give you warts. That's just something your mom or grandma would say so you don't play with toads. Not true. Okay? You do not get warts from touching a toad, even if it pees on you. <laughs> Why they do that? And, and they almost always do. You're right. Why does a toad pee on you? Because it's scared. Now, that's a human emotion. Do I know that it's scared? No, but you can just tell because a lot of people pee their pants when they're scared. Uh, okay, okay. Going from first-hand experience, maybe. When people are frightened, do they pee their pants? Maybe, maybe. Um, how we know that that is a, an animal that is concerned about our presence is because we are a predator. It sees us and knows that we could be a predator to the toad, and we might want to eat it. Any of you have any plans to eat this toad? No, no don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Don't even give it a kiss. It will not turn into a princess, okay? This is an animal that has poison on its skin that will make it taste terrible. It'd be like you licking the bottom of your shoe. Ugh, gross. And it has that tendency to go to the bathroom when you pick it up. It is something that actually it stores water in its body. It will sit in water, soak up water into its body, into its bottom, soak up that water, so that it kind of has like a drinking fountain internally. And if it ever needs water to hydrate itself, its body can use it. But it's also able to quickly evacuate that water and make you go, ew, gross, and want to put it down. So all it's doing is, is expelling water from its body. We think of it as pee, but it's probably just, just water. It hasn't even gone into its, through its digestive system. It may just be water that it's soaked up into its body. But a great defense. If I picked you up and you peed on me, I'd put you down. <laughs> All right. So our American toad, a great example of an animal that needs these little ponds and wetlands. If you have a small pond or a wetland by your house and you're concerned about it being a haven, a place where mosquitoes will come and reproduce, it's okay to leave it there as long as you have predators like a toad. You're going to find things like dragonflies and damselflies and giant water bugs and whirligig beetles and all these different types of insects, including a toad, that will be predators. So as long as you allow predators to be in this small wetland environments, you're not going to have problems with mosquitoes because they're not going to be there. They're going to get eaten up. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, a lizard is a great example of an animal that we do have in Michigan. Um, I think I have a picture of a lizard. I'll let Delena look for that quick. You might find a lizard here in, in, in the Whitehall area because you're not very far from the river. This is an example of the, one of the only two kinds of lizards we have in all of Michigan. It's called the five-lined skink. Has you ever found a five-lined skink before? If you have, that's awesome. They're an animal that is something that would like to live along the forested edges of rivers. And it'll be an animal that also eats lots and lots of bugs. Every time I've ever found one in Michigan, it has been in a forest not too far from a river. So if you can imagine those places where there's a forest ecosystem along a river, you might be able to find the five-line skink. They're not monster ones. They're not alligators and crocodiles. They're about that big. Okay, maybe five to seven inches at most. And they have a very special adaptation. The toad is poisonous, or it pees on you. 
Does anyone know what the five line skink will do if it's uh, threatened? If it thinks you're going to eat it? <laughs> what will it do? Um, its, tail. its tail will fall off. Exactly. Its tail will fall off. And you'll see this. This is an example of a juvenile or a young one with that blue tail. The adult males don't have that blue tail anymore, but the females and the, the juveniles do. And it's something that will have that tail fall off, and then you'll see the tail wiggling on the ground like this, and the predator might go, ooh, I love to eat lizards, and it'll eat the tail, and the adult, or the, even the juvenile, will be able to run away. It won't have as much of its tail as it used to, but at least it's still alive. So great example of an animal you can find along the rivers here. Again, it eats bugs. If you killed all the bugs, you wouldn't have our five-line skink. The only other lizard we have in Michigan is called the six-lined race runner. And you'd have to be over on the east side of the state near a city called Saginaw to really find one. They're not common around here at all. You're not going to find alligators or crocodiles or iguanas or chameleons in Michigan. These are the only two examples of lizards that we have. Uh, I'm going to go to this little guy first and I'll come back to you. Yes, sir. It is something that we're going to share in just a minute here. We'll come back to that one, okay? It is, you're right, you're right with your guess So what it is. Yes, sir? It will grow its tail back, but not to the same degree that it had, had before. Uh, salamanders will do this as well. It will fall off. Um, that's a good question. I think it's just once, too. I think it's a one and done. I think it's a one and done. They, they actually like lose vertebrae yeah, when they do it, but then they don't grow those back. Right. So when the tail regenerates, it's just like fatty yeah. tissue. Oh. So it doesn't kind of a stump, kind you know. Of dexterity that its other tail oh, would yeah, have. One, one escape. One, one escape yeah. Or, yeah, that's his one get out of jail free card. Yeah, that's it. All right. So uh, an animal that sometimes looks like a lizard is what we're going to take a look at next. Anyone know what looks like a lizard, but it has skin like a frog or a toad? What's it called? Do you know the name of it? Snake. Oh, good try. Not a snake. Not a snake. Good guess, though. What do you think over there, sir? You are right on a salamander. Now, we're going to see how good you are at salamander identification. We have 10 different kinds of salamanders that you can find in Michigan. I did bring one, right? OK, good. I did? Yeah, you did. You sure? Oh, I did. Look at that. I forgot what I brought. That was like an hour and a half ago. What, forgive me. OK, let's start with this one here. This is actually our most common type of salamander. We're going to see. We're going to test Miss Delana, see if she can even find one inside this cage. It's its own little mini habitat. Oh, oh hey, Perfect, right there. Uh, so <laughs> this is, oh, and a good example of one, too. It's a small salamander. Maybe see if you can hold it up high enough for everybody to see just to begin with here. Might have to turn that way too. Anybody have guesses? This is about as big as they get. It has an orangish, brownish stripe down its back. And some of them, not all of them. Any guesses? This is called a what? What do you think? A worm. It's a good guess. It looks kind of like a worm, but it has legs. It actually has a backbone. It's a vertebrate animal. This is called a red-backed salamander. Redback salamander. And there are times when in a forest environment, like around the library here, this might be the most numerous of all the different vertebrates that you can find. There's going to be more redback salamanders than squirrels, more redback salamanders than birds, or owls, or, uh, or whatever other vertebrate animals you find. Because under one rotten log, you might find five or six of these things. And think of all of the rotten logs in a forest. This is a great example of an animal that really requires you to leave trees when they fall down right where they are. Instead of making that big old burn pile of logs that you want to get out of the way, if you put those big rotten logs in an area where they can slowly decompose and turn into dirt, you make a habitat for animals like the red-back salamander who eats bugs and worms. So if you have a forest environment, a forest community by your house, and you have trees that fall down, as long as they're not in the way, as long as they're not going to cause problems for mowing the grass or something, you can just leave them laying on the ground. And you make a, like a hotel for salamanders. Yes, sir. Oh, you'll see. Don't worry. You will see what that is. You will see what's in that box in just a few minutes. 
So red back salamander. Well, Delane is bringing around the red back salamander. I forgot I even brought the red back salamander. That's a wonderful one. This is another kind of a salamander. See if you can guess which this one is, which is the one that you will be able to touch when Miss Delana comes around to you. It's pretty big. This one you will be able to touch when Miss Delana comes around. It lives also, good question, it also lives in a forest ecosystem. It will also live underneath rotten logs. In fact, it would eat redback salamanders. Big rotten logs and elite worms and the bugs that live there. Do you guys know Pumbaa and Timon? You know how they like to roll over logs and eat bugs? This guy will do that. He won't roll over the log. He will simply burrow himself down. He'll dig under the loose soil of a rotten log so he can find food. So he likes to eat all those same bugs like Pumbaa and Timon. A tiger salamander this is. This is something you can find around here, absolutely. So this is, again, another animal that will benefit from you leaving rotten logs in a forest because that's where they'll find their home. Yes? You know, that redback salamander um, lived behind my house, and I knew I was going to be doing some programs with amphibians, so I caught that one behind my house. And then when I'm all done using it to teach kids, I'll let it go back behind my house again. This one here, I have a friend that caught it down near the city of Kalamazoo at a, at a park down there where he was, where, where he was hiking. Okay. I'm going to let Miss Delena take the tiger salamander now. This one, you can touch, and you're going to have to remember that it is a vertebrate animal. It has a backbone, so we want to make sure that we're gentle with it. If we try to squeeze it or poke it, it could break its bones. That'll really hurt it, okay? so you've got to be gentle. <laughs> tiger salamanders, American toads, redback salamanders, tree frogs, all these different amphibians have a skin that is very susceptible to poisons and pollution. So you will know you have a healthy environment or backyard if you have amphibians there. Their skin is such that they can drink through their skin. Like when you sit in uh, Lake Michigan or you take a bath, do you drink the water through your skin? Do you drink the water through your mouth? Lou, don't do that either. No, don't do that. Don't drink bath water. That's yucky. We can't do that. Our skin is designed to keep the water out or when it's really hot to let the water out when we sweat. But a tiger salamander, just like a frog or a toad or any other salamander, has skin that is we call permeable. If you can imagine me taking Miss Delena's uh, uh, jacket here, and if I was to pour water into her jacket, do you think it could hold the water? Yeah, let's try it and see. It won't, because there's little bitty tiny holes in this material, and the water would eventually drip through the bottom. What about if I was to put water in this plastic container? I don't see any holes in the bottom of it. If I was to put water in this container, could the water drain out? Nope, it would stay there. So our skin is like the plastic container. Keeps the water in, keeps water out. The frog or the toad of the salamander is like Miss Delena's jacket. It can let water in and let water out. So they always have to be uh, in an environment where there's a lot of moisture. That's why you're going to find frogs and toads and salamanders in cool, wet environments. And, and something like a frog, they're known to, uh, to draw oxygen through their skin, too. They might get as much as 80% of their oxygen. Instead of breathing, they'll get oxygen right through their skin. Wouldn't that be cool if you could plug your nose, open your mouth closed, and breathe. They can do that. They can do that. Yes, sir, question. Um, the, what is the tiger salamander's defense? Oh, great question. The defense of a tiger salamander. It's not something that will hurt you, but a tiger salamander does have a very small amount of poison in its tail. And if it wanted to scare you away, it would take its tail and smack you with its tail. And it might not be enough to do anything to you, but if there was another tiger salamander who was stealing his dinner, stealing his worm, he might smack the other salamander with his tail. And that small amount of poison would be transferred to the other salamander, and it would go, okay, I guess I'll let you have your worm. So that's how they can protect themselves. They don't have any other defenses. They don't have nails. They don't bark like a dog. They don't have claws, you know. They 
are going to defend themselves by being hidden. You won't see these things just cruising around your backyard. You'll have to find them underneath a rotten log or something like that. They don't have very good defenses. That's a great question. Okay, any final thoughts about our salamanders? We're going to be done with that one in a moment. I'm going to move on to another animal. They don't make sounds. No, they're not known for making sounds. Um, of all of our salamanders, I'm not aware of any of them making any kind of a sound. Not like a frog or a toad. Thank you, Miss Delena. We'll go ahead and put that one away. Next animal I want Mr. De uh, Delena to get out is another one that will be impacted by people because of people like my dad. I'll tell you what. When I was growing up, I, I was like an outdoory kid, but I had a dad who was uh, not real fond of one particular group of animals. Anybody have a guess which animal I'm talking about? Oh, good guess, not frogs. He was cool with frogs. Snakes. Snakes. Oh, you knew it, snakes, you're right. And if I was ever out taking a hike with my dad or something like that, and I saw a snake, I'd say, Dad, what kind of snake is that? He'd say, dead. No kidding. He actually had said that to me when I was a kid. Dead. He didn't care what it was. He was going to kill it. I had to learn that snakes aren't so bad. They actually have a role in nature. You don't have to love them. You don't have to take one home and sleep on it like a pillow. But understand their purpose. And this particular snake that Miss Delena is going to get out for us is a big predator of animals that we do not want around our houses. We'll let her get it out to see first, for, for you all to see. And then we'll talk some more about it. <laughs> so does anybody know what kind of snake that Miss Delena is holding right now? Anybody have a guess? Oh, good try. Not a water snake. A very good guess. They look similar. If it was a water snake, you know what we'd be doing? Biting Miss Delena's arm repeatedly until she put it down. Water snakes are known for being pretty aggressive. This one is not aggressive. What do you think? I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with color. Oh, good try. Not a blue racer. What did you say? Blue racer. Oh, good try. Good try. Not a blue racer. What do you think, sir? Oh, good try. Not an owl snake. Oh, not a diamondback. We don't have diamondback rattlesnakes in Michigan. Good try. Yeah, it'd be difficult to hold one. They can't climb. This one's special adaptation is that it climbs. It's a wonderful climber. If you go hiking in a forest, you can find this kind of snake climbing on trees like it's climbing on Miss Delena's arm. What is it? Oh, good try. Not blue. Close, though. Oh, good try. It is a cousin to a corn snake. It's related to them. Yes. Oh, it likes to climb trees. One more guess. You got it. A black rat snake. Okay, it's called a, sometimes people just call it a black snake, but it is called a black rat snake. It is a species of snake that is arboreal, which means they climb trees. They will eat a lot of small animals like uh, birds and rodents. They're great mouse catchers. So as Miss Delena brings this around, you're welcome to touch it. It is a nice snake. I cannot guarantee it, will, it, will, it, will, it won't bite you. If I put my fingers in your mouth, could you bite me? Yeah. Oh, don't do that. Don't bite me. If I don't put my fingers in your mouth, you won't bite me, right? Deal? Good. Same goes with the snake. Don't put your fingers in the mouth of an animal, including this snake right here, because they have a mouth. They could bite. Because it hits so bad, it barely, you barely feel it. Yeah, this is a pretty good-sized snake. Um, it has a big mouth. It can eat something twice as big as its head, but you don't look like food. So as long as you keep your fingers out of your mouth, I think you're pretty safe. Does it have teeth? It does have teeth. It has teeth inside of its mouth that are backwards facing teeth so it can grab hold of things that are trying to get away and swallow them down. Good question. It does have teeth, but not fangs. It is a non-venomous species of snake. Not poisonous. There's no such thing as poisonous snakes. They don't exist in the world. They can be venomous. This is non-venomous. It is a species that is considered special concern. So it's not threatened. It's not even an endangered species. But because of habitat loss and persecution from people, people that don't like snakes, that just want to kill them when they find them, there's not that many black rat snakes around anymore. So it's your job 
to allow these snakes to live because they are a great mouse catcher. Unless you want a mouse living in your house, you want this one around. You want this snake around. It is also known for climbing trees and eating birds and birds' eggs. Go ahead, right here, we'll let you ask a question. Oh, it is probably wrapping around her arm because it's cold and Miss Delane is probably warm. It is a cold-blooded animal and in order to warm up, it can't sit out in the sun. These lights aren't warming to us. So it'll wrap around her arm and go, ooh, you have a nice warm arm. I'm gonna stay warm by holding onto you. Good question. Ooh, good question. How often do they shed? This is an animal that will only shed when its skin gets too tight, too small. Just kind of like you don't just go to the store to go shopping just cuz, do you? Good, don't do that. <laughs> you don't need more clothes. You're cool with what you got right now. But there are times, especially when you're kids, where your pants start to get a little short on you and you need to buy new ones. Or your toes are like this inside of your shoes because you need new ones. Snakes can't go and buy new skin. They have to grow their own. So when a snake sheds, it's because its skin got too small for it. It has to grow new skin. Good question. I don't know who asked that one. What do they do in the winter time? A rat snake is going to find a place to sleep. And in fact, we actually have a spot on our property where we have snakes that will sleep together in what we call a hibernaculum. It happens to be a rock pile that we use to teach students about rocks and minerals. But a couple of years ago, we discovered in early spring a picture like this where there's about seven snakes in this one picture that I took where they were all sleeping in the cavities, the spaces between the rocks at that rock pile. So a rat snake, though it cannot dig, snakes cannot dig holes. You ever been walking by a hole in the ground and you say, snake hole, you're not quite right. A snake might live there. It might live in a rodent den. Let's say a chipmunk made a hole in the ground. It went in there and ate the chipmunk and now it lives in the chipmunk den. But they didn't make the hole, okay? They will find cavities in trees, underground, in rock piles like this where they can sleep. If you have a great big pile of wood that you're just waiting to burn and it's been there way too long and it's not really good wood for burning anymore because it started to decompose, that could be a place for a rat snake to sleep underneath that, that wood pile. Yes, sir. That's what? Oh, it's, no, it's a lot of snakes. Yeah, that was a pretty cool day. I was excited to take that picture. A rattlesnake? How many of you have ever found a rattlesnake in Michigan? Let me see. Hands up for those that have found a rattlesnake in Michigan. How did you know it was a rattlesnake? How did you know it was a rattlesnake? It had a tail on it. Yeah. And it rattled. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. You are probably one of the very few people in Michigan that has truly found one then. We have one type of venomous snake called the Eastern Massasauga. And it is a species that, like the black rat snake, is a species of concern. There are not that many of them left. Not being from the area, I have no idea what their populations are up here. Has anyone ever heard of people finding Massasauga rattlesnakes around here? It's possible. I, I don't know the area well enough. Okay? If you do have them in the area, that's awesome. Okay? That is actually telling you that you have a good, healthy wetland environment. If you ever find a snake in an environment where there's a lot of sand and sand dunes, it's probably not the venomous snake, but it might scare you nonetheless. If you find a snake and it does this to you, I took this picture, sorry, it's a little blurry. It's because it was opening up its mouth, hissing at me, and striking at me. But it never bit me. Does anyone know which snake this is that is a great actor? It will not bite you. Sometimes called a puff adder, but it's not. A puff adder is actually a species that is venomous. This one's not. What do you think? Correct. A hog-nosed snake. It has this little upturned nose so it can burrow itself into sandy soil, but it is not venomous. 
it will make you think it's going to eat your face off <laughs> by opening up its mouth like this and going <laughs> and flattening out its neck like a cobra. But it will not bite you. It will not bite you. I've never, ever, ever had a hog nose snake bite me. Despite the fact that he was doing this, he didn't bite. If I had continued to agitate him after I had caught him and, and took this picture of him, his next line of defense, instead of striking at me but not actually biting me, would be playing dead. He will not bite you. Hog nose snakes are not known for biting. You're more likely to get bit by a garter snake than a hog nose snake. And I've never heard of anybody getting bit by a hog nose snake. Is it possible? Absolutely. But not likely. Yes, sir. Puff adder is venomous, but you're only going to find them in Africa. Oh, okay. That is a common name for this one, but it is not actually the name of this species. Okay. Yep. Well, that's cool. Hognose snakes are a pretty neat creature. If you do have hognose snakes, that means you probably also have toads, which means you probably also have a very healthy environment with a sand dune ecosystem. So that's a great thing to find is a hog nose snake. All right. Thank you, Miss Delena. Let's let our uh, rat snake go away. I think what we're going to move to next is maybe just a couple of quick animals that are not alive, like this one right here, where our young friend over here was talking and asking about. This is an animal that can have significant impact on our lives. What is it? A raccoon. You got it. And as opposed to having Miss Delena walk around with this uh, skin of a raccoon, we're going to simply pass it down the rows, and you'll get a chance to, to touch it, OK? We'll kind of pass it right down the line. Raccoons are an animal that takes advantage of human environments. Yes, they have been in Michigan for a long time, but they really do their best when you aren't paying attention, when you throw your trash on the ground, when you don't cover up your trash cans. They get into them. or this is a big problem. You have a pet who has a food bowl or a water bowl outside of your house. Anybody have a food bowl for a pet outside of their house? Not inside of their house, but outside. If you do, you might be encouraging the raccoon to come and get an easy, free meal. And when they do that, that's when there's contact with people and pets. They can carry lots of diseases and things, so they're not something you want your dog or your cat or your kid interacting with. And you can actually have your pet get very sick. They can get distemper from animals like a raccoon who might be coming to drink from water bowls. A fox is another example. You don't want to leave dog food or dog water bowls or cat water bowls outside because then you're encouraging wildlife to come and use that too. Even when you're not paying attention. They might come at night when you're sleeping. That's when the raccoon's active. And he's going to come out and be active and drink out of that water bowl. And now suddenly your dog is sick. So don't do that. Raccoons are something that have grown in popularity, uh, in abundance, excuse me, because of people. Not popularity, but in abundance because of people. Our interactions with each other, creating trash, and uh, kind of being a little bit lazy when it comes to our trash sometimes encourages more and more raccoons. If you ever happen to find a raccoon, a baby raccoon, or anything like that, leave it alone. You are a terrible raccoon. You're a person. Okay, leave it alone. Especially if it's a baby raccoon, leave it alone. It could be that there's a parent nearby and you don't want to mess with mama raccoon. Did you have a comment or a question you're going to ask about? Are they uh, aggressive even without messing with them? Like, will they attack you? They, they're not going to necessarily attack you. No, no, I mean, they're going to be frightened of you. If you ever have been like camping before, which this has happened to me all the time, they get into your stuff if you're not paying attention when you're camping. As soon as they see you or you shine a flashlight on them, most of the time, they're going to go running away. If they don't, that's the one that's used to people. And you have to be more careful with, because not that it's going to come and charge at you like in scary movies or something like that. That's not the case. But it will be something it might not back down as quickly. So give caution to the ones that don't just run. Yes? What about them? The boxes. Oh, the boxes. We're getting to those. We're getting to them. Yes? Yep. Every night. So you got to be careful. Make sure there's not something else that's attracting those raccoons. We don't want more raccoons because raccoons will eat our salamanders. They will eat our frogs. They'll eat our toads. 
and eat our turtles. They are actually a big predator of turtles. And so we don't need more raccoons by us being lazy. Did you guys have a comment or a question over here? Uh-huh. How do you keep raccoons out of your bird feeders? Out of your bird feeders. That's a good question. My best solution for that is by not feeding the birds for a little while. It probably in the next three weeks, birds won't need you anymore. I know a lot of people like watching the birds, but usually by the beginning of June, I tell people that you don't need to feed the birds anymore. There's lots of bugs out there. There's seeds out there. There's plenty of nature's food. They don't need your sunflower seeds. And if you have a real raccoon problem, stop feeding the birds. The birds will be okay. They were okay before you got there. They're going to still be okay. Yes? Skunks too. Skunks too. You got to watch out for skunks too. Okay? The, the skunks especially are something that can also carry some diseases that you don't want to have your, your, your pets interact with. Nor do you want to get sprayed by one. That's no, no fun either. Okay, another animal I would like to have Miss Delaney get out for us is an animal that can also be impacted by people, but in a positive way. It's an animal that will find a home in a tree. If you leave a tree that is dead standing up in your yard, you might have a woodpecker come along and peck, 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 make a home in that tree. When the woodpecker's done making that hole in the tree, because it only uses it for one year, other animals might use it. Maybe a squirrel. Maybe it's a big enough hole. You get a raccoon. Maybe it's a duck called a wood duck. Or maybe, just maybe, it's another flying predator. It's a type of a bird that will fly at night looking for food like mice. Again, we don't want mice in our house. We want this one around. And bugs. They're good at catching moths and other flying bugs uh, like beetles. What do you think I'm talking about? Good guess, not a bat, although bats are very cool. I did bring a bat skeleton just in case we started to talk about bats. We have nine species of bats you can find in Michigan. All of them eat five-year-olds. I mean, no, they don't. What do they eat? Bugs. They, none of them are going to be um, animals that are going to suck your blood. We don't have any vampire bats here. We don't even have fruit bats in Michigan. All we have are bats that like to eat bugs. So bats are a really good critter to have in your backyard, but that's not it. This guy would eat bats. What is it? An owl. Now, what kind? We have 11 different kinds of owls in Michigan. Oh, not a great horned owl. Good guess. Another kind of owl. He said great horned owl, but that's not right. It's a smaller owl. What do you think? I don't know. Another kind of an owl. We said great horned already. A barn owl? A good guess, not a barn owl. What do you think? Screech owl. Screech owl is right. Right on. The eastern screech owl. Miss Delane is going to bring one out for you to see. Now, this is a live bird. You won't be able to touch the live bird. There are special rules on this permit that we had up here that says you're not allowed to touch it. But when Miss Delane walks around, she's going to stay up here at the front for a moment. But when she walks around the room, she will bring with her a wing and a talon from the owl that you will be able to touch, okay? The reason that we have this screech owl is that it was hit by a car and has an injury to one of its eyes. I believe it's its right eye, is that correct? Yep. Okay, its right eye. If you look closely at its right eye, that black part of its eye called the pupil, it's kind of oozy looking. It can't see out of that right eye anymore. So it's hit by a car and blind in one eye. Very difficult for it to survive with only one eye. So that's why it is living with us at the Outdoor Discovery Center and teaching people like yourselves. Yes, sir? Full grown. Right. Full grown. That is a full grown screech owl. And we suspect that this is a male. Why do we think it's a male? Because the males and the females are different sizes. Who do you think is bigger, the boys or the girls? Raise your hand if you think it's the boys who are always bigger. Girls. Okay, raise your hand if it's the, you think it's the girls who are always bigger. It is a trick question. You're right on. It is the girls who are larger. And in owls, sometimes it can be up to a third larger. This little guy right here weighs about as much as about $3 and change in your pocket. Okay? He weighs nothing. Very small. The girl only weighs about 75 cents more than that. So this is an animal that is small, but despite its size, is a great predator. Moths. Things that you don't want eating your garden plants. You know, different types of moth species. That's food for a screech owl. 
Things like a mouse that you don't want living in your house, that's food for a screech owl. And for those of you that don't like, uh, one of the groups of birds that people don't like is blue jays. I have a, a no, in, I, I'm indifferent really to blue jays. I think they have a purpose, but if you're not a big fan of blue jays, guess what? They get eaten by screech owls. A screech owl is almost as big as that blue jay, but every single screech owl nest I've ever found in 15 years of finding different nests and things like that, I have found blue jay feathers in every last screech owl nest I've ever discovered. So they have a real affinity for, screech, uh, for a, a barred owl, uh, blue jays. Yes, sir. What's that? No, not a dinosaur head. Not a dinosaur head. So this is the eastern screech owl. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Yep. Is there? Is it a pileated woodpecker? It's a. If it's a loud one that looks like Woody the woodpecker, it might be a good size one. It's. It's called a pileated woodpecker, and they're the ones that sound. You know how Woody the woodpecker got his laugh. You know, they have that, <laughs> it's because of the bird that is, it's most closely uh, uh, modeled after. It's called the pileated. I'm going to play the sound for you. And if you've ever heard Woody the Woodpecker, you'll be able to understand the connection. Uh, let me find it quickly here. Okay, so here's the sound of a pileated woodpecker. This is like 15 inches long. Here's the sound of a pileated. Listen. <laughs> Sounds like it's laughing. Okay. That's a big pileated woodpecker. If they make a hole in the tree, certainly going to be big enough for our screech owl to fit in. This is a bird that does not hoot. It doesn't give a hoot. Instead, it makes a horse-like whinny sound. So its call, I'm not sure you're going to be able to hear it. It's a little bit softer than the other birds that I've played. I'm going to try it out, though. This is the call of an eastern screech owl. Listen. So if you've ever heard that sound at night, it's kind of a scary sound. That's why I got the name Screech Owl. That's the sound of this guy right here, the Eastern Screech. <laughs> It is not our only owl that lives in a forest environment. We have the barred owl and the great horned owl that are also common. Great horned owls are the big ones. They're the ones that do that real deep, real deep hoots. But we also have the barred owl. It's one that does not have these ear tufts on top of its head. They are not ears, just ear tufts. It has a rounded head and it sounds like it's saying, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? It sounds like this. That's the barred owl. So these are our three most common owl species. The screech owl, the barred owl, and the largest is the great horned owl. Yes, the young lady has a question or a comment. Go ahead. They are, not all owls are nocturnal, if that's what you're getting at. Some of our owl species are not nocturnal, like... There's a type of an owl that we were just talking about before the program got started. The snowy owl. This is one that was only going to be active during the daytime. And where they like to live is the tundra, way up by the North Pole. The only reason they come here in Michigan is because mom and dad kick them out of their nest. And they've got to go somewhere, and sometimes Michigan is just the right place for them. So this one is like us. It's called diurnal, or active during the daytime. Screech owls are nocturnal. You can see he's talking to me right now. Okay, this is a full-grown eastern screech owl. This is a boy. All right, we'll go ahead and put away our screech owl so we can get another critter for you to see. You can see he just he can fly just oh thank you sir he can fly just fine. He just can't see well enough to fly. We have another screech owl at our center that they thought was going to be released after it got hit by a car, and they let it go, and it flew right to the side of a building, crashed. They, they looked at it, nope, nope, they looked at it, and they went, oh, no, uh, uh, 
he's okay. Now he's all better. They, you know, they made sure his eyes looked like they were going to work. They let him go again. Bam, right into the side of the building again. So what they suspect happened is there's something wrong with his compass up there. And now he can't quite navigate or orient himself to figure out that you avoid the great big side of a building. That's pretty tough. He's not going to be able to catch a moth if he can't see the side of a building. So again, he lives with us at the Outdoor Discovery Center. One of the things that we're known for is our birds. If you do get a chance to visit us, we have hawks, owls, eagles, falcons, and vultures that we use for teaching quite a bit. So if you do come visit us, you'll be able to see like bald eagles. We have two bald eagles and a golden eagle. You can see those in captivity, okay? Yes, sir. In Holland, we're on the south side of Holland. Again, that brochure on the table will give you, there's a map on the back of it too. Yes. It cannot. I was just going to get to that before I was all done. I was going to say there are some common misconceptions about owls. One is that they sleep all day long and they wake up and are awake all night. Not the case. They don't have the luxury of a nice warm bed to sleep in. Okay. And when you go to bed, you are probably sound asleep. If you're anything like my kids, I have a, a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. And when they fall asleep, I could pick them up and move them around like this and they're, like, and they're still sleeping. Okay? We aren't going to get eaten while we're sleeping. Okay? Screech owls don't have that luxury. So during the daytime even, if there is something out there that this could be a problem for them, a predator or some other kind of uh, a thing to annoy them, they're going to wake up. But then they'll also take little snoozes during the daytime and nighttime. One more thing about that owl though too was, can they turn their heads all the way around? No. They have a backbone just like you, okay? They are a vertebrate animal. Can you do me a favor? Can you come up here for a second? I'm gonna use you as my example of a human. Are you a human being? No. I'm, yes, you are. Okay, with your head facing straight, okay? I want you to tell, can you see me where I'm standing right now? No, you turned your head, you can't do that. You gotta keep your head right there, okay? Can you see me where I am right now? You move, move your eyeballs, that's okay. Yeah. You can see me, okay? What about? Over here, can you see me? Yeah. Okay. What about now? Yeah. Eh, maybe. What about now? No. What about now? No. Okay. So she is now like the head of a screech owl in that her eyeballs, we're not having her really move her eyeballs a whole bunch. Screech owls can't do that either. What they can do, now I want you to be able to turn your head. You got to keep your shoulders facing that way and you can move your head all around too. Can you see me? You can turn your head if you want to. Can you see me? Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. Can you see me? Can you see me now? If you turn your head, sure enough, she can, right? Screech owls are going to be different than our, our, our young lady here because their eyes are more or less fixed. They can't move them around a whole bunch. And where she can turn her head, maybe about 90 degrees or 100 degrees. You've done math in school. You know all about geometry, right? Nope. Yeah, you should. Yeah, it's not, you're still in school. Uh, so uh, 100 degrees, you might be able to turn your head. Maybe some people 120 degrees, like over their shoulder. But screech owls? can do much more than she can. They can turn their head 280 degrees around. That would be like this young lady here, turning her head so that her head looks over there. And then we should be able to turn back like this. Wouldn't that be awesome if you could do that? Yes. That would be great. Thank you very much. Why don't you go ahead and take a seat. Let's give her a hand. She did good. Okay. They can turn their head up to 280 degrees so they can move all around and see everything around them. Okay, we have one more animal for us to share. This is an animal that's very important, especially along river systems. This is an animal that has a very long history, longer than most of you have been alive. This is an animal that has been an endangered species in the state of Michigan. It's a flying animal, so it's a bird. Doesn't mean that it's a bat, it could be a bat. It is a flying predator that is a bird that loves to eat ducks. In fact, people used to call it a duck hawk, but it's not a hawk at all. Do you think you know it? Good try. That's a red-tailed hawk. Good try. Chicken hawks and red-tailed hawks are the same. What do you think? An eagle. Oh, good try. Not an eagle. One more guess. It is a type of a falcon. We have four different kinds of falcons in Michigan. And this one is a species that is an endangered species because we don't have good habitat for its type of bird. It likes to live on the edges of mountains. Any mountains in your backyard? No. No, maybe sand dunes, but no mountains. This is always going to be a species that is going to be an endangered species in Michigan, unless we build lots and lots of skyscrapers that look like man-made mountains. 
and they'll live on the sides of them. Anybody have a guess what kind of a falcon I'm talking about? You know back there? What do you think? If you have read a book, and this is a great book, if you're in fourth grade or up, this would be a wonderful book for you to try to read. It's called My Side of the Mountain. Sam and his friend Frightful. And the type of bird Frightful is, is what the answer I'm looking for. The Atlanta Not the Atlanta Falcons. No, no, no. Good try. Nor the Atlanta Hawks. It's called the Peregrine Falcon. Peregrine Falcon. So Miss Delana is going to get out a Peregrine Falcon for us to look at. Just the same like our Screech Owl. You won't be able to touch the falcon, but she will have wings and a talon that you can touch as she walks around. The peregrine falcon is a species that likes to live up on the edges of high cliffs or the sides of big, tall buildings. Just a few minutes south of here in Grand Haven, I know in particular, they have a peregrine falcon that lives on the side of their smokestack. Okay, that's that thing that makes, it's a big, tall tower that's like a chimney for their power plant. They have peregrine falcons that live on the edge of it. And where is that power plant at? Right next to the river. Now, again, not knowing enough about this area, is there a power plant in the area or do you get power from out, outside of the area? In Muskegon. And in, actually in Muskegon, we drove right past the power plant then. I know where you're talking about. That smokestack, that great big one, would also be something that could have a peregrine falcons living on the side of it. Do they? Okay, that's possible. I, I don't know enough about it. That's wonderful. Okay. Yep, everybody's got to go. They go to the bathroom sometimes. Okay, a peregrine falcon is a bird who has really been affected. Its history has been highly affected by people. Way back before you all, all you kids were born, there was a chemical that we used to use all the time in our environment to kill mosquitoes. It's the same chemical that could affect other animals, but it really affected the peregrine falcon because the peregrine falcon ate ducks, and the ducks ate fish, and the fish ate the bugs that had the poison in them. And so the poison went from the fish, or from the bug, to the fish, to the duck, to the falcon and made it so their eggs were fragile. When mom birds came and would sit on their nests, they would crack their own eggs and the babies couldn't de develop. It's a chemical called DDT. Fortunately, we've stopped using DDT here in our, uh, our, our country. There are still countries in the world that use it. When the peregrine falcon migrates out of Michigan, it still has to contend with the use of DDT in southern, uh, uh, southern North America, so in like Mexico and South, there are still countries that use it. But here in Michigan, we don't use it anymore, and here in, in our states, we don't use that chemical because it does something called bioaccumulation, where it builds up in the animals. So this is an animal that was brought back to being something you can find in the United States. It was not only found in the United States, they're found throughout the world because of people called falconers. Anybody know what a falconer is? A person who takes a bird and uses it to go hunting? Instead of a, a yeah, a, like frightful in, yeah, yeah, my side of the mountain. A bird that is used to go hunting. Instead of using a gun or a bow, a, bird, a person uses a hawk or a falcon to go hunting for things. Like you'd use a red-tailed hawk to go catch squirrels. Falconers were really known for being able to raise birds in captivity to make more birds so they could hunt more and more with their animals. Because of their knack for making them reproduce, they were the ones recruited to help not only the peregrine falcons, but the bald eagles. So bald eagles and peregrine falcons have a very similar story in that they were um, affected very significantly by human involvement with a chemical called DDT. So again, this goes back to, you don't need to spray for bugs in your backyard. If you have a healthy environment, everything will take care of itself. Granted, you still might want to put an insect repellent on your own skin because not all of the mosquitoes are going to get eaten. But this might be that lesson that you don't need to spray a chemical to kill all the bugs in your backyard because there's good bugs and there's bugs that aren't so bad. And then there's bugs like a mosquito or a tick that you might not really want to have in your backyard so you provide predators to those bugs and you'll be better off.
that's why he's